Hello. In this webinar, we'll be discussing ways to teach our kids about what's happening in the world in an age-appropriate way and how we as parents should be able to respond to their tough questions. Children are never too young to learn about diversity, but how, you bring up top, but how do you bring up topics of racism, injustice, especially to younger kids? We're not experts, and we have not written any books about this, but as a panel, we're sharing out of our personal experiences as how we broach this subjects with our own kids. The discussion will be a conversation based on selected questions submitted by both panel members and also those who have registered for the webinar. We hope that this time will be beneficial and will provide you thoughts, insights, and practical tips. Let's meet the panel. Who's going first? Moses, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> wife jesse uh and we have uh two kids uh two boys age 10 and 12 um and uh i am uh an engineer turned lawyer turned contractor and jesse i am a homeschooling contractor. uh my name is brian and this is my beautiful wife Oh, Christy. I was going to say, you going to say my name? <laughs> uh, we've been married for 12 years. Uh, I'm a pastor at Grace Church, um, and we have three kids, um, almost a three-year-old boy, and then a five-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old daughter. Um, and then two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, we had a... How old is she when she moved in? 18, 19? Yeah, she had just graduated high school. Yeah, 19. a 19 year old uh, biracial girl that moved in with us and now has become part of the family uh, two years ago. And uh, we're the Browns. Um, my husband, Kevin, um, and I'm Joanne. And we have two beautiful children. We have a 13 year old daughter and an 11 year old son. Um, I'm an educator and elementary uh, school teacher by trade. And I'm the director of um, operations and QA for a software company um, in Boston. Um, so we had a we had a bunch of questions um, that um, we we looked about and and, and were actually um, suggested. First question that actually comes up um, that we want to um, um, broach as a, uh, a panel is when was the first time you recognized race? When did it become apparent and how did it impact you? So, I mean, I don't mind starting. Um, for me, um, it was in kindergarten um, and I was at school. My mom was picking me up uh, from school one day and my best friend turned to me as my mom um, pulled up and said, why, um, why is your mom black and you're white? So just let me back up and give you some context. Um, I'm biracial, uh, my mom is Irish American, my dad is African, um, both my birth, those are my birth parents, but I was adopted as a baby um, by two African Americans and raised um, by them. And so, you know, that was the first time that I really recognized that there was a difference. So when I got in the car, I said to my mom, I was just like, mom, you know, she just said to me, why are you white and your, and your mom's black? And my mom said to me, well, you know, you're just light skinned like your father. And so my father is a light, was a light skinned African American um, uh, man and my mom was a dark skinned African American woman. And so that's how she kind of explained it to me. Um, but, you know, as I grew, she later explained that I was adopted and she told me about my birth parents. Um, and that's when I really started to deal with colorism um, and, you know, in, 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 in my community and school and everywhere I was, there was always this, well, you're not white enough and you're not black enough. And so I, I kind of dealt with those kind of issues and, really, and it, it impacted me in that way throughout my schooling up through college. Um, and so for me, that that's where I first recognized it and, and that's how it impacted me. Okay. Uh, for me, I, I grew up uh, on a military base. And so uh, 
all through elementary school. I mean, I noticed that there were different races, but not any sort of racism until I was in uh, until I was in seventh grade, and then uh, I switched schools um, off the base um, and that school, the, the elementary school on base was super diverse. All my friends were different, everything. Um, but then in middle school, the school was not diverse at all. And so uh, there were some racial jokes and stuff for the first time that I was really like, what are you talking about? And that was the first time I really encountered racism. I think um, for me, it was around middle school as well. Um, the town I grew up in was a very small community with no diversity. And I actually, because there wasn't any, I didn't realize um, until I was in middle school and I had um, a friend from a summer program who um, was a black boy and my family had a huge problem with it actually. And that was when I realized, wait a second, I know I, in my heart, I didn't notice any difference but then their response to our friendship was confusing. And so that was, I think I was in sixth grade or seventh grade then. Okay. Moses, Jesse. Um, but I didn't really think about it um, because you know our, our town was fairly diverse growing up, and for a very long time, when I, when I was younger. Uh, my best friend w was white and, um, uh, you know, I would go to his house, I'd sleep over at his house and, and, and vice versa. So it, it, it wasn't really, uh, even though it was uh, identified, it wasn't really a problem. And I, and I didn't really encounter any issues with it, I think, until probably either sometime in, in, in middle school or high school. Then, then I started to think a lot more about it and, and started to uh, see some of the, the impacts um, at, at that point. And for me, I would say I was about maybe 13, uh, maybe 14. We moved from our neighborhood, which was very diverse, into a neighborhood that was not diverse. And um, the neighborhood that we moved to made it clear that my kind um, and anyone that looked like me or any of that um, was not welcome. Um, and this was in the 90s, and in that community, um, kids were still being bused to the high school because they were not able to walk to school because um, there was a lot of rioting, uh, words being said, names being called, and yeah, it was also confusing and scary at the same time. And that, you know, my friend, just people who looked like me were not walking in the neighborhood, so yeah. So it, it, it definitely goes out that, you know, we we all recognize, you know, race in, in different things at um, different times. Um, but as we talked about it, we talked about the first time where we recognize that that people view people of color differently and um, that it, it comes in. There is um, and we talked about that, I, I guess, a bit. Does anybody want to flesh out and, you know, talk about that? Um, when you realize that people viewed people of color differently. Um, for me, it, um, I, I, I was born in Jamaica. Um, so I was born in Jamaica and I came here when I was um, between eight or nine years old. And um, when I was in Jamaica, um, everybody um, that was, uh, you know, my doctor looked like me, um, the mechanic looked like me, everybody looked like me. And um, when I came and I, I, I moved to um, Brooklyn, New York, um, it, was, it was a different world. Um, and it, it was at that point in time that I realized that um, not only um, was there a, um, there, not only was there a, um, the fact that I was not liked. I wasn't expected to do good, and, and that and, and that was 
that was something that broke my heart as I as I went through the school system. Was a, it, it was like a, it, 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 I wasn't expected to do good, and I, I realized that people were treated differently at that point in time. Yeah, he often talks about how he was expected to excel at in, in Jamaica. Like that was just the culture. And when you got here, there was this expect. There was not that expectancy of for you to excel and to be, you know, amazing or great or intelligent. Um, I think for me, um, you know, as a kid, my dad, um, you know, shared stories about, um, you know, we grew up in Roxbury and my dad actually worked, um, he was one of um, the only black men who worked at a, a computer company uh, in South Boston. And so he would share stories about the fact that um, in the seventies, he, his, his boss, a white man would have to literally um, he, my mom would drive him to JFK station in Dorchester. He would get out the car and he would be smuggled in the back of the car into South Boston to go to his job that he was more than qualified for. But because the residents in that community um, did not want a black man there, you know, he literally had to be smuggled to and from work. And that like stayed with me. And, and you know, he talked about how they would shout insults at him you know, if they saw him coming out of the building and he could never go to the corner store and get a, you know, a drink during his break, you know, and, and for me, I could see that. I'm like, why can't you just drive to work? Um, and so for me, that was the time where I really felt like, they were, you know, people of color and, and black people specifically were treated differently. Yeah, for me, it, it was that middle school experience when I heard the, those jokes and stuff. And I, I remember, I don't know if I've actually ever told you this story. I, I went home and asked my mom, like, or I was just, I think I was just telling her about my day or something like that. And she told me a story about, uh, so my dad died when I was seven. So she told me a story about uh, when I was, when I was little, uh, my dad's friend came up and my dad lived in Louisiana, grew up in Louisiana. My dad's friend came up and they all went out to dinner and my dad's friend was in the KKK and put a card on the table with essentially a death threat for the waitress. And my dad went to the bathroom and came back to pay the tip or something and saw the card and took it off. And then, uh, so that's when my mom explained what the KKK was and what my friend, my, my dad's friend was into and all that. And I was like, holy moly, that was the first time I was exposed to I guess the racial slur was hatred and racism, but on the, you know, on the extreme of the KKK, that was the first time I'd really even heard about it or anything like that. I think mine was uh, middle school with my friend Jamal, but then also, um, you know, in high school, there was actually only um, one other person of color that I remember attending our high school and they didn't stay because they were treated so badly. And it's interesting, it seemed normal to me, which is so sad. It's hard to look back about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's real. It's, no it's interesting that, um, that we all had some. It's, it's interesting that we've all had some, uh, some perspective uh, uh, from, um, from family. You know, I, I, I also. And my, my parents, I think they, they did their best to try to uh, uh, shield us from as much as possible. Um, and, and, you know, they had high expectations for us as well. But but a lot of it was the result of um, the struggles that they had endured. So uh, my, my parents were uh, also in a generation where they had um, uh, they were the first ones in, in high school to, to integrate at their school. Um, so their senior year of high school. Uh, was in a time where they had to go to to a school um, where the school was all white and and uh, and they you know had come from a, from a black school and so they had to to go through that experience so um, you know they they shared those struggles with us um, not not so much to, um, uh, to to make us uh, fearful but just to let us know you know the kind of things that they had to to deal with and, and overcome and, and similarly my my dad he, he became a police officer. Um, after college, and, and he was in a situation where um, he uh, he was the first black policeman in our county, and um, you know, and, and and he 
dealt with with racism even at, on the on the police department. And so um, I, again, I don't think he he you know, there, there were some really serious stories that that he shared with us that you know at the at the right time you know they they would have made you scared, but his his intention was not to scare us by telling us that, but it was to to inform us and to let us know about the thing that that he had overcome um just to know you know uh as you as you move forward and sort of the expectation is that you can be an overcomer you're going to face challenges but you can be an overcomer and so um just even as a parent that that's sort of the the kind of perspective that i try to put on and i, I don't want my kids to be fearful but I, I do want them to be able to 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 lean on everything that's been uh, gone through just just to help make them uh more um uh to make you stronger. Mm. No, definitely makes sense. And it, and it, it talks about it, 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 you know, not for it to be fearful, you know, it's more for you to be aware, right? You know, our, our kids need to be aware. Um, you know, we talk about it with the fact that, you know, we tell our kids all the time that they need to be circumspect. And that means that you're aware of everything that's happening around you at any given point in time. Um, so given that with the, the time and, um, the, you know, the fact that people need to be circumspect, what is prompting the need for the discussion on race now? You know, because as, as we go through, it sounds like race is a discussion that is happening or the discussions about race are happening all the time. But what about the time now that is, is bringing in the discussion for race? Yeah, for us, I mean, this wasn't something that we really ever thought about talking to our kids about. Um, mm -hmm. And now with uh, the girl who joined our family, uh, she went to the protests in Boston and, you know, she was making signs or a t-shirt or something like that. And our seven-year-old was asking what, what does that sign mean? What, what happened? What, why are all these people going into Boston? Why are all these? And so that night um, she stayed at the protests longer than she should have. And she uh, wasn't. She got tear gassed essentially, and called us. Um, and we have like a an app, a location sharing app on our phone. And so I was able to see where she was, and I, I pulled up the live news reports, and I could see where the bad stuff was going on. And I was trying to get her out of it. Um, meanwhile, I didn't know, but our seven year old was awake in the bedroom and was hearing everything. Mm -hmm. So I had her on speakerphone and I was telling her where to go. And, uh, and Christy was, was there talking to my seven-year-old trying to, trying to filter what she was hearing from the news and the, and, and on the phone. And so. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, our kids have had a very different experience than what I grew up having. And even Brian, I mean, they have grown with diversity all around us. I mean, our neighborhood is a, a, a representation of the world. You know, our our we, we, communities yeah. are intentional. And, um, you know, from birth, they have had such dear friends and family members. And we have had to them, you know, we actually have a fond memory of, of Evie, um, and, and a friend's child just sitting across from each other, you know, just playing with each other's hair and, you know, just appreciating how different that each of them were made by God and just, wow, your hair is beautiful, but I love yours too. Mm -hmm. And so now introducing this was such a tr tricky topic, um, but our seven-year-old is an observant, pensive internalizer. Like she was not only noticing everything that was happening in the world. And honestly, the culture of our family is to discuss current events with our kids. And so she had heard Brian and I talking about um, different aspects of what was happening in our communities. And so she was concerned about Essence's safety and wanted to know that she was safe. And so I made a judgment call to burst her bubble essentially on uh, about racism because um I felt like it was worth it for her to become an ally to her friends and people who are dear to her and to understand 
understand that even though we haven't experienced this ugly from the world, that it does exist and that she as a person and as a child of God can be ready to stand up and be supportive and to show love in a prepared way and not be sidewinded by, you know, some situation that we didn't have control over. Um, So that night, when we brought it up, I did explain to her that there are people who struggle with looking at people with darker skin with inferiority. And that's not how God intended for us to respond to them, that they were created in God's image, just as we were. Um, And she actually, her response, and and my four-year-old was kind of listening, although I don't think she was really paying attention like Evie was, but she took it in and she, she was like, angry like a like she immediately had this like oh i can't what how do you like how could you not you know think that they're not what that just is you know a, you know impulsive and she was just dumbfounded that that would ever even enter into someone's mind let alone someone intelligent and sophisticated would have that point of view and so we prayed that night that people were safe and that god would help our family to be in a position to show love and to, you know, be allies for people who, you know, are working through struggling with that attitude. Um, Actually, one, one more thing. So it was interesting because the next day, um, because Brian wasn't in that situation, he was like, Oh, I don't think we should tell her about racism. And I was like, uh well <laughs> we already did that we exactly we're a little late for that um but um, you had a, a really interesting perspective about that because it was completely opposite of mine you didn't think we should tell her yet yeah i felt like it would strip her of her innocence like sh- she's so pure hearted that the idea that someone different from her would be thought of any differently is not a concept that she even understands. So I was like, man, is seven, is seven the age to do that? Or even if it is, what scope do we tell her? We tell her that there's, I I didn't even know how much to tell her. Should we tell her anything? How much should we tell her? Yeah. Um, And then each of our kids are different too. So, so our seven year old is super observant, like Christy said. But our four-year-old isn't. I think she could. I mm-hmm. think our four-year-old could wait longer because she doesn't. She yeah. doesn't. She's not a, a observant like that. So. And yeah. then Chris knew that she already did it, and I was like, "Well, all right." <laughs> <laughs> already did. <laughs> yeah. it's, so it's I, interesting, uh, Christy, that that you refer to it as as the bubble bubble being bursted because I mean. I mean, it, it, it really is that, right? So, um, you know, we, we, we debated a bit as well. It's like, okay, at, at what point do you have this conversation? Because, I mean, you, you, you want to preserve the innocence and, and, and the purity um, of your children. Um, and, and so for, for us, I, I feel like we, you know, everything that's happened recently um, didn't spur the first conversation. Um, but, but it did, it did further the conversation. Um, and, and for us, it was, a, a, again, an awareness thing that, you know, it, it's, it's, I, I want my kids to, you know, have the perspective and the view of, of, of everybody, but I also want them to realize that, that there are going to be people, um, that, you know, for, for various reasons, um, that, that don't see everybody as equal. And, and I don't want that to, to, to catch them off off guard. Um, and, and I also don't want um, uh, to, to put them in uh, harm's way because they're not aware of that. So um, the incidences that have happened recently with, with George Floyd just, just sort of furthered that conversation. But it's always a question of, okay, um, how, how much do you say? Um, and and how, do you, how do you say it in a way that, that doesn't create uh, fear or anxiety for them? Um, and, and at the end of the day, um, but, but still uh, keep them uh, safe. You know, you want them to know that this is this is the reality. There, just like they're just like they're people that are going to do bad things. Um, they're going to be people that that have 
um, perspectives that that don't align with, with yours or, or with God's. Uh, but at the same time, even though they do that, um, just like God, God wants us to, to love everybody. So that, that that's the spin that we try to put on it at the end of the day. It's just like, you know, the people that do bad things. Right. So they're also going to be people that um, view you differently. And just because they do that, that doesn't mean that that, you know, that you have to do the same thing back to them. Um, or that you should feel any any type of way to, to certain groups of people. You know, God wants us to love everybody, but at the same time, you have to be aware of that so you don't put yourself in, in a in a in a bad situation or that you don't get caught off guard if if it does happen. And we've started this conversation with them since I would say probably kindergarten when they first started school. That's when the conversation first started. And um and it's progressed through the years. We probably started with just the basics. And, and now we can get a little deeper with them because they are 10 and 12. Um, but it's still heartbreaking to have to have these conversations with our two boys. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, how did you broach the subject the first time? Like what, I mean, I, what yeah, did you I, actually say? Yeah, I can speak to that. I think mm -hmm. the first time that, you know, I realized that um, our 13 year old recognized race and recognized the difference was when she was in pre-K. Um, she had a best friend who up through fifth grade who, you know, was white, blonde hair, blue eyes. And she would be asked to draw self portraits of herself or she'd be drawn and she would literally draw herself white with blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, and so I had to then start having the conversation of showing her uh, her own uniqueness and her own beauty, right? And and I had to begin to have, Kevin and I had conversations with her about your brown skin is beautiful. I, bought, I bought this book, um, which was an amazing book um, called Shades of Black, A Celebration of Our Children by uh, Sandra um, Pinkney. And it really, you know, I had to show her this and I had to show her that, you know, people of color come in all different skin tones, skin tones and, and that you're beautiful and that her brown skin. So I had to, we had to do the work of affirming, affirming her. And I think, you know, those were the beginning conversations about race, that your hair is gorgeous, your curly hair, God gave that to you. You know, he made you unique. You know, your hair is amazing. It could be styled in so many different ways and all of those things like so that's the that's the work we started with, like affirming um, her as God's creation, wonderfully made, and affirming our son in that way, and and yeah. and showing the diversity of uh, you know of our culture and teaching our culture. And and, and so definitely, and, and we went through that, and we saw that um, there was a growth. Um, so she got to the point that she started loving herself, and her portrait started becoming of her brown skin with curly hair. And so that that was great to actually see that happen. Um, but then, you know, a, a, as we go through and we talk, you know, like we, we had to go through a, a burst the bubble experience also, because they went to a school where, um, you know, there there is a, a little bit of every culture there. And um, a, around the time uh, of, of Trayvon Martin, um, as that was just going through the, uh, through the media, um, we had to have the conversation with our son, Quentin, um, and um, that it, 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 it was, and, and, it, and as we talk about this, right, every time we have a conversation with, the, with, a, with our children, it has to be not just age appropriate, it also has to be child appropriate. You know, everybody's talked about their child and they know who their child is. So when you have that conversation, make sure that you're talking to your child and it's appropriate for your age, but then also who they are. Um, but we had to have the conversation as we went through with Quentin to let him know because he kept on asking, he was asking about Trayvon and he was asking um, because it was in the news, it was in their school, it was in everything. We had to have that conversation to say, you know what? Your friends love you and they're of every culture and that is wonderful, but you're going to run into different situations where people are not going to like you. And it's for nothing that you have done. And um, this is a kid who um, he, we nicknamed him the mayor because 
you you throw him out there in the wild and he's coming back with penguins as friends. Exactly. You know, it, it, it's just, that's you just how You put him in any there. social situation and he knows everybody in the room and he started a new game. Agreed, so, right? So like, you know, so that spirit in him, we didn't want to kill to that. To break it, exactly. break that spirit. Um, but we had to tell him the reality of this world that as brown and black men, you know, you will be targeted. Um, and we, you know, that, you know, people will follow you around in the store um, because they might think that you uh, stolen something or judge you based on the color of your skin or not think that you are brilliant or intelligent or smart or, you know, so we, we had to share yeah, and, that. And, and he was about, um, Trayvon Martin, um, was that two, three years ago? Yeah. Um, he, so he's around seven, eight, eight years, years old, old, which was, you know, tough, very tough age to, you know, start broaching that topic. But it was also making sure that 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 he was aware. Um, so as we so we we've gone through and, and we've talked about you know um, how we're discussing race, and I, I think one of the things that we definitely need to, to bring up here is is God concerned about race, right? It it, it comes back the whole thing, you know. It, it, it's it's um, you know. Uh, the, the world seems to be concerned around race so much. And, you know, there's so much um, issues and problems that have come out of hate from, from one to another. Um, but in, in this scenario, is God actually concerned about race? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. He is. He created us in his own image. Genesis 121 says that, right? We are all image bearers of God. God created each of us uniquely. Um, you know, brown, black, white. I mean, we are all in his own image. So, yes, he cares about race. He would not have created us so uniquely, you know, uniquely if he didn't care. I mean, it shows his it shows his amazing um what's the word i'm thinking about like just the creativity his creativity exactly. right Definitely. his creativity mm -hmm. like just the the nuances of the different species in nature like i mean god god created us uniquely so yes he does care about race mm -hmm. and i think yeah. it, go ahead no go ahead kevin now, and, and, you know, the, the Bible, you know, talks about um, so many different scenarios, you know, where it it it, um, it brings in the fact of um, who God is and, and, and um, what he actually cares about. You know, so it, even in Acts chapter eight, um, where it talks about Philip and, and how God interrupted this whole scenario um, for it, Philip to go talk to the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and the whole focus behind that was how do we actually reach this individual so that he could actually go back into Ethiopia and, um, and, and, and ensure that, that more people get to know Christ, yeah. you know? And it, 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 so in, in that scenario, although God is um, the creator of race, I don't, he is not um, a respecter of any race over another race. Right. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna mention that we homeschool as well and we spend a lot of our time out in nature and um, particularly my middle child is just obsessed with watching and so she, and then her watercolors come out and and we had a conversation just about the fact that even just picking one species of something like birds if a god that created such a wide array of this thing i mean he, there's no way that he would have created one single type of person. I mean, he enjoys creating diversity. Yeah, definitely. So as, as um, we... Okay. Moses, ahead, Moses. Moses or Jesse, did you have something to share? Well, we were just going to add to that um, Romans 10, 12, where um, it talks about that there's no distinction. So to God, we're all the same. We're all created again, his likeness and his image. And um, that's the way that he intended it. And I think that's the, the way that we really need to start thinking about it. There is no distinction. We're all the same. And, and that's, that's, that's not to say that, um, that, that so, so 
God, God uses just, just like so with my two sons, Caleb and Benjamin. Um, they are uh, very different boys, right? Their personalities are different. The way they talk, the way they act is different. Um, I, I, I love them both, uh, but I appreciate their their differences and, and I recognize their differences. So um, in, in the same way, God, God does that. And, 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 you know, he doesn't place uh, more emphasis on, on one uh, over the other. And, and at the same time, we know that, you know, that the, the enemies, uh, he's on the opposite side, right? He, he, he wants us to look at those differences and say, okay, this one's better than that one, because at, at that point, now we start um, uh, uh, becoming divided and we start um, uh, categorizing ourselves. And, and, and it's just a, just a point to, to, for there to be confusion and strife uh, between us if we look at those differences and turn them into something that's, that's negative. And so, um, uh, you know, it's just the, just the opposite of, of what God does. He looks at the differences and sees them as positive. He looks at them and says, okay, these are the ways that these things can be put together and, and made into something that's even more beautiful as opposed to separating them out, um, which, which, you know, is something that is, is done by, by man. It's a man-made construct to, to separate them out and, and then use those uh, differences uh, against each other. So um, uh, that, that, that's sort of the perspective that we have on it. And, and if, I mean, truth be told, racism is sin, right? It is, it is sin. Um, you know, it does not please God, right? It, it truly doesn't please God. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, we, when sin entered this world, our world became broken and racism is a byproduct of that. Um, and it, it is not pleasing to God. And, and he calls us to love one another Right. We love him first, but love one another as we would uh, love, ourselves. love ourselves. Right. And and so if we are showing racist behavior, we are not loving each other in the way that he intended us to. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And I, I, I think it definitely calls out the fact of um, God created this way. So we should celebrate the fact that God has made us unique and appreciate the beauty that God has actually put in us and not just for us but for our neighbor and our, our neighbor is everyone, you know? So um, that, that's something that we definitely um, need to, um, you know, continue and in, to, to model. Um, so I, I do want to jump into, um, because as we look around and we see everything that's happening um, in, in, in the world, um, you know, um, to black people, to brown people, um, how do we, as families um, deal with the anger around injustice? Because it's definitely there. You know, how do we discuss the unrest that our children are seeing in the media? You know, how do we fight the right fight when um, all the guns are turned on you, you know, or um, they're turned on your, um, the people that you love? You know, how do you, how, how do you deal with that anger? How do you deal with the injustice? Black man um, in, in America. I mean, when 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 you see the things that are that are going on, um, it, it does create a a, a a new level of of anger inside of you. Um, you, you 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 feel that you know that that you are being targeted, and and you know, I I can I can count numerous times that that personally that that I've been pulled over for for you know not having violated the law and and you know having been given a reason for why I've been pulled over uh, other than being told that um basically that I, that I look suspicious um and you know it, it's it's created some some fear but it also has created anger um and, and I didn't realize I didn't really appreciate that until I got into college um, and I got pulled over with a group of friends and, um, you know, they, they all went into a certain mode and I, because I had grown up, I guess, maybe a little bit more innocent, a little bit more aware in the South. I didn't even realize what they were doing, but they were preparing themselves for, an, for an encounter with the police in, in a way that I, I wasn't aware of. And, um, you know, uh, so some of those conversations begin going at that point, but, 
Um, but it also made me, um, uh, it made me upset. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I, I had to bring it back to, to, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, um, I had Pastor Sean talked about this recently, but, um, but ultimately my, my identity, uh, first being with Christ. And so that, that has helped me to deal with the anger. Um, but also realizing that, um, while I, while I can be upset, I have to have to fight the right fight and, and fight it the right way. Um, both for the sake of my family um, and, and the sake of, of my sons, um, but also for those around me. So, you know, it would be it would be wrong for me to look at it and, and feel that there's nothing that I should be doing. Um, you know, that that would be uh, an inappropriate response. And, and I think that as as a Christian, you know, no matter what what race you are, um, you know, when we see those injustices, we 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 have to, to stand up for those that that are feeling the injustice and, and, and those that are, that are suffering from it. Um, but, but, you know, I, I've certainly had to pray, you know, God, God helped me not to be angry. God helped me, um, not to hate my brother. God helped me not to look at people and say, you know what, um, uh, let me not, let, let me not group them all in the same category because, you know, that's exactly what the enemy wants me to do. He wants me to, to look at it and say, okay, um, this guy is, is white. And if somebody, who's white has done something to somebody that's that's black or brown, then I should be upset at them and I should be angry at them and I shouldn't trust them. And, and, and you know, I, I know that, that that's not what God desires. So ultimately for me at the end of the day, I just had to keep bringing myself back to the scriptures and reminding myself of, of what God wants me to do as, as a Christian and that that's love. And so it's also caused me to be more open um, with uh, people of, of an opposite race. So, to be more open with people that are white so that we can have conversations so that I can share with them my experiences and they can share with me um, their perspective so that, you know, as we have those dialogues, they, they can understand what I'm dealing with. And, 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 and that way we can figure out, okay, what can we do? Uh, how can we work together to, to, to deal with this? And I, I think that helps me deal with the anger. Um, you know, I think, you know, how to just, you know, our kids are 11 and 13. And so they are seeing the media, you know, we try to limit as much as possible. Um, but, you know, they're exposed, they, they know what's going on. Um, but, you know, having the conversation with kids about, you know, people are hurting, right? You know, when I saw the George Floyd video, like, I wept, I was heartbroken, because that could be my son, that could be my husband, that could be my daughter, that could be me. I just, it really broke my heart. And I think we have to, we have to, you know, yes, yeah, that anger can, like, like you said, Moses, right? That anger can, can um, sow seeds of bitterness, but you do, you, you I, I had to pray. I really did have to pray, but, you know, people, we're going to go through the, the, the range of emotion, right? Heartbreak, sadness, anger, right? Um, lament like we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do that and that's natural um but i think you know discussing that with children to say you know you know brown people and black people have been treated unfairly and they are trying to you know protest and stand up um and say that enough is enough and that we need to be treated equally um and you know sometimes people get angry and you know it, that's okay that people are mm -hmm. angry it's okay Agreed. to be angry and and you I think bringing it to like if how do you respond to injustice right so mm -hmm. if it were your family member that something unjust happened to how would you respond to that like I think asking that question like you would be angry if it were your brother who you know um, you know got pulled over or, or got shot or whatever it is um, you know and just really like bringing it home to like, it's natural to feel these emotions, right? And, and, it, and it's okay. And it's you know, okay. It, it, this is, I, I think a lot of the times it, it comes back, it's okay to be angry, but I, I, I did, you know, echoing off of what, um, you know, um, um, Moses. Moses said, it's, it's when it festers, mm. right? You don't want it to fester and um, to form into something, but you have to use that for positive. And, you know, um, it, it's not about becoming insular, right? 
um, and, and, and just trapping yourself in, you know, oh, we're, we're just going to be around our kind because around our kind, we're safe. That is not the way that it goes because God made our kind, right? And so everybody is our kind. And so that means that anytime that it gets to this point, it's, it's, um, it's education. How can I help the people around me? You know, how do I have that conversation with my neighbor um, when saying something that I don't agree with? You know, how do we, um, you know, um, look out for each other? How do I, you know, do I know all my my um, my children's um, um, friends' parents? You know, it, it, it's all of these things that you know, not about getting insular, but actually spreading out to make sure more people are actually aware. I think for us. Um this brings up a huge talking point on our side from a different perspective, though, because part of the reason why we I did choose to burst the bubble for us um, was because we want to coach our kids to be ready so that when they see the anger and they see the lament and they see this happen, it doesn't catch them off guard and they do nothing. But then they are in a position to empathize and support and love and be bold and stand up to help educate others as well so that these situations happen less and less. And, you know, even though our kids are so young, I think, um, you know, we had discussed as a group too that they, it doesn't necessarily have to be a conversation. It can be modeling. Like, um, Kevin, you had mentioned, you know, having relationships in our lives where we, our kids see us having tough conversations and being bold and, you know, we see injustices ourselves doing that hard thing in the grocery store, wherever we might see it, um, even if the, the people aren't directly connected to us, um, so that our kids are taking it in and learning how to love in a bold way that is uncomfortable, even, it, it, but it would bring about love and support to those in their lives. Oh, definitely. And I think that that brings us into that, uh, the whole topic of, of allies, right? Um, how can we be uh, better allies? You know, what what are what are the things that we could actually do um, to be able to attack these circumstances? We we everybody here on this panel, as we talked about the first time that we actually saw um, what happened, um, that that um, a person of color was considered less than somebody else. You know, we had we had a, a barrage of different stories, and um, how. If we teleport back to the past, you know, how do we be a better ally in that situation? How do we bring that to our kids now and um, make them be aware of that? I think just, you know, I think it's important to um, listen, um, to acknowledge the experiences of people of color and what they're going through. Um, and empathize. Um, I think, I mean, that's the beginning, Li just listening, not brushing it off like um, it doesn't matter because it's not happening to me. I think, you know, silence sometimes sends a message that, you know, it's not my problem. But like Christy said, being bold enough to speak up, like that's what you 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 need to do, right? And to, to say something if you see it. Um, I think, um, you know, we we have to come at it from the perspective of like, what would you do on behalf of your own flesh and blood if it were happening to your own flesh and blood? Like just be, just, or putting yourself in the shoes, right? Like stepping into the shoes. And, and, and sometimes that means just, just sitting there and listening and, and being, a, you know, a person that they can just, just talk to and, and you can ask questions, you know? Um, I think those are, that's the first step. Yeah. Okay, so I have, I, have a, I have a question as a white guy, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so I have friends that are all different colors and watching their Instagram, I almost get mixed signals, right? Some people say, listen, some people say stand up and say something. Some people like, 
So for me, I, on at least on social media, I've been silent because I don't know. I feel like if I say one thing, then I'm going to anger this group of people. Mm-hmm. If I if I stay silent, I'm going to, you know, be complicit in whatever's happening. And so, like for me, I don't know what to do in that situation. So what? I don't know so, if there's a right answer or not, but no, that that is an excellent question. And, and truthfully, it is do what your heart is telling you to do. Mm. You know, because truthfully, this is what happens. It's 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 the fact that um, so it's it's my brother, right? So I. I am going to do what I feel in my heart is right for my brother. So if I am being prompted to post something, I am going to post something. Um, If I um, need to listen for my brother, you know, it's kind of like, it's it's a relationship, like, um, you know, a a relationship with, with me and my wife, right? There's sometimes where she wants me to fix the problem and then there's sometimes that she wants me to listen to the problem. <laughs> and sometimes you get it wrong and you try to talk to so be listening and then it all just blows up in your face and you're like, what? <laughs> exactly. No, but I, I, but I think, I, I think Kevin's right. Doing what your heart feels, but also uh, showing your solidarity uh, and speaking up and being bold, um, I, I think is, is important. Yeah. And, and, and it also comes back at its relationship, right? Um, a lot of the times um, there is, um, there's a feel or a need that I need to do something publicly, right? In order to um, make it right or, or to justify something or to, or, or to, to sign off. And, and, and truthfully, what, what happens is that it's a, um, it's a relationship thing. So as all of this is going on, I have a, a ton of friends that are, um, you know, uh, of different cultures. And instead of, of, of posting things, they were calling me. How are you doing? You know, I, I wanted to check in. All of this craziness is going on. You know, how are you doing with all of this? You know, what can I do to help? You know, and, and um, it's, it's varying things. You know, you could actually go and you could um, donate to the Justice League. You know, that, that, that's something that, that's there to help people who have been wrongly accused or, um, you know, been, um, you know, wrongly accused, arrested um, and, and put in jail. That, that's something that, that, that will be beneficial. There, there are a ton of different things that can happen, but it still comes back. It's that relationship, it's personal, interact with the people closest to you. And if you feel inclined to, to have to post something um, in so- solidarity, that's all in your heart. It's what God is prompting you to do. So hopefully that was beneficial in the answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with, with what Kevin said at all. Um, uh, you, you have to do what's in your heart, and 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 when when you when you're when you're concerned, you know, um, should I not do this? I, I guess you have to ask yourself um, wh- where where the concern or or the fear um, comes in at. Um, the you know I, I've I've had more of my white friends post things recently um, than, than ever before, and. Um, particularly for the ones that that I have uh, relationships with um, even you know I have a friend from from law school um, who, who I saw and, and and the fact that he he was angry about this and, and was willing to post it, it just just lets me know that you know this is somebody who who, who if he saw it happening to me right I, I know that that he would have my back and that he would be upset about this as if he were my actual, actual brother. Um, so um, I, I think you have to think about uh, uh, the relationships that are around you, but, but it also brings up the point that, you know, as, as parents, um, it's so important for us to have um, uh, uh, diverse relationships, right? It, it's so important for us, for our kids to see us interacting with people that don't look like us, for them to see us having like 
meaningful relationships with those people so that they would know, you know what, we care about these people. Um, if something happens to them, uh, we're going to be there for them. We're going to do whatever we need to do. But also on the other side of the aisle so that they can know, you know what, um, uh, uh, there's love there. Right. Um, if, if, if as a black man, if, if if my kids see me having meaningful relationships with somebody that's white, you know, then then that helps deal with the anger issue that helps deal with with. OK, that helps deal with the trust issue. Can 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 we trust uh, white people? Can we trust people that are Hispanic? Can we trust people that are Asian American? Well, my my parents have uh, meaningful relationships with those people. These are the things that they do with them. Um, so in, in addition to sort of helping inform, you know, how we should respond on social media and other outlets, I think that having those meaningful relationships um, will, will really have an impact on our kids, you know, um, in, in, a positive, in a positive way. So we have to, I think we have to go out of our way um, to make sure that uh, all of our friends don't look exactly like us just for the sake of our kids, right? They, they need to see us having meaningful relationships so that they can know that they have a model. This is what it should look like um, in, in, in the ideal case. And I think that makes it easy for them. And, yeah. I, and to piggyback on that, I think, you know, having those, being okay with having the honest conversations and the uncomfortable conversations, because it is going to feel uncomfortable. Talking about race um, is going to feel uncomfortable, you know, at first. But if you continue to have those conversations um, and educate yourself, um, and become an, uh, um, you know, an ally, then, then that uncomfortableness will go away. Right. Um, and so I think on the other hand, like, I think also as we're having these conversations that, you know, um, to, to be an ally, we can't just, you know, we can't, um, use the words like, you know, oh, I'm colorblind or I don't see color or, you know, we're all equal because that's not, the, you know, that's not true. Yeah. Right. But it's, it's not true and it's not helpful. It, it, it And we do see color and there are you know, there is individual racism and systematic racism. And so we have to and acknowledge that. Right. Um, and and br bring that and educate ourselves about those things um, and be OK with having those hard conversations and um, getting pushed back and, and and having a hard conversation with every and anyone, um, you know, it, it's as. Um, you know, I've started having these conversations with um, people as they call up, you know, one of the things that they'll share um, is, you know what, uh, you know what, my grandma was racist. Um, and, you know, there were certain things. Now, I, I didn't realize it then, but now I'm realizing it. And there were certain things that she would say and different things that she would do. Um, but it's feeling comfortable to say, I don't agree with that, you know, and it, it's that that conversations happens with family, that conversations what happens with neighbors. And it's, you know, as much as, you know, my, my son and, and my daughter's growing up and I would have them stand up for anyone. So it's not just people of color, you know, which they are, but anyone. Right. If they see anybody being unjustly treated, um, they need to stand up and say, no, I don't agree with that. You know, and so uh, I, I think that perspective change and, and, and being willing to empathize and, um, yeah. you know, um, be uncomfortable. I think a, a scripture that has been kind of, you know, on my heart and one that I have been kind of just um, ruminating on is Micah 6, 8, you know, um, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy? To walk humbly with your God, and I think this is the time. This is this is our call right now for all of us, right? To act justly, right, and to love mercy, and to to stand up against the racial injustice that are happening in our world, and and to educate ourselves about how we can um, change this, right? How we can change it in the world. Yeah, and so you definitely said something, and, and do want to you know talk about it um, where it's um, educating our kids. You know, um, we talked a lot about, um, you know, approaching a topic, you know, after, um, you know, some kind of um, racist act has happened or, um, you know, racism has been brought up. But 
how do we go through go through the process of actually educating our kids on a on a on a daily basis? I know for us, our kids are younger, but we we purposefully. I mean, we live in Randolph, which uh, I think is the most diverse town in Massachusetts. But um, we we purposefully seek out diversity with the people that we hang out with, with the friends that we choose to spend time with. Um, it even came down to we specifically had a conversation when our our firstborn was I don't even know two, but we got dolls that weren't just white, right? There were there were dolls that were different shades of color, mm -hmm. just so that diversity was everywhere, even in the toys and stuff that she had. Yeah, I think it's the culture that you have to create in your home, in your lives, and then it becomes natural for your kids. You know, if it's not natural for us, there's no way we're going to artificially create it for our kids through a conversation or through, you know, a book or even the toys. I mean, if that's not something that we're modeling okay. as people, then the culture in our home isn't speaking that way. So, but yeah, I, yeah, the dolls and, um, yeah, I, stories and honoring people of diverse backgrounds, not just famous white people, um, has been a habit in our homeschooling curriculum too. And I think also um, just educating our kids and teaching them the truth about history. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes it just depends on school to teach them about history, mm -hmm. but all they do teach is the European version and then February, they teach about Dr. King and uh, Coretta Scott King. And, you know, it's just the same old, same old every single year. They don't expand. And it's really up to us to, to dig into the truth. I mean, this whole nation was founded on racism. It was taken away from the natives. It, it's just we have to be the ones to talk to our kids about it. And we do it at the right age we speak to them um, in the right terms that they can understand we're not going to share with them some i personally am not going to share some things with my kids that i don't feel they're ready for and we all have to gauge where our kids are at and it's all it is about having uh those diverse books and those watching those diverse movies and even with the movies being careful what kind of movies you, the, the kiddos are watching um, how are the minorities uh, being portrayed in, in the movies that you're that you're looking at? Are they being portrayed as strong and brave? Or are they are being portrayed as criminals? I mean, we just have to be, have to be very very mindful. And also with that is um, yeah, teaching history, teaching history, teaching them the truth. Um, and also, when the kids, when you're at the store, and and the kids say, "Hey, mom, I want this doll," and the doll doesn't look like them or you, um, you have to be careful not to say, "Ah, oh, let's pick this doll because that's going to teach your child that hey, something's wrong with that color. Therefore, when I see that color in real life, I'm going to react the same way my parent reacted when I wanted that doll or that toy." Mm -hmm. uh, so just being mindful of the things that we do, and, and also. Uh, just share them with them and being honest with them that racism exists and that we need to, uh, you know, we need to make a change. Yeah, we definitely talk about, yeah, in our house, it's, it's exposing to books. So books in, in, in different movies and, and making sure that um, the characters that they're, um, that are there are, you know, it, it, it comes back to exactly what you said, Jesse, they're not typecast. Right. So, you know, um, I, I could, you know, we we go through, we actually um, read a um, a um, a audio book um, last listen summer. To audio a, a listen, a, yeah, listen to an audio book um, about the new Spider-Man and the new Spider-Man um, was brown in a sense. And and my kids just loved the fact that it was there and, and they got into that story. But it's, it's ensuring that you get to a fact of, um, you know, killing the narrative. You know, yes, there is um, a culture that uh, that pushes down, you know, a, a another culture. But then it, it's our, our job as parents to um, to be able to educate them, to um, 
go out of our way to do research to ensure that they're getting the right information, you know, funneled to them. Right. The Bible says, train up a child in, um, in the way um, he should go, right? And when he gets older, he will not depart from it, right? And so we really, we're called to lead our children, not only spiritually, but then educationally as well, right? We're, we're so concerned about how they're educated in school, right? But we also need to educate them about race and, and, and um, like Jesse said about like the, the history of it, you know, we need to do our part as parents and, you know, our home is filled with a ton of books and there's like, you know, books that kids can read at different ages and just making sure that that literature is in your home. Um, so your kids are reading it, not just reading, you know, books that they may get from school, but a, a diverse set of, um, of material and educating yourself. Like, I think mm -hmm. Christy said it, like, we have to be the role models, right? We have to be the role models um, of anti-racist behavior in our home. And so then our children learn from us, just like they learn, you know, how to be more godly from our spiritual, you know, our example of, of showing godliness and holiness in the home. We also need to do that about being anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so guys, we, we thank you for joining us. Uh, I know that we all agree that as parents and caregivers, we must have confidence in ourselves and our children that we can handle tough topics and tough situations. Um, we must understand that our role to be honest, specific and trustworthy as we raise the next generation to confront um, racial injustice. Now, discussions in race and injustice with your child can be uncomfortable, but they don't need to be. What they need to be, however, is continuous. It means that it's just not one time that we're having it and we're just gonna throw it away. It's something that happens as your child grows, as your child understands more. Um, it also needs to be age appropriate and child appropriate. We talked about that. Um, children are never too young to be introduced to different cultures, um, but you pepper it in as you see your child needs, as the um, you see them grow. And it also needs to be celebratory instead of discriminatory. Um, because we, God created us all in his image and he celebrates us. He celebrates his fact that he actually created us all in his image and we're beautiful just the way that we are. Um, so some of the, um, the we'll, we'll figure out the, a, a way to actually get some of these resources. If you need them, feel free to reach out to the church. We'll see what we can actually do to provide some of these books or um, some other information um, that, that would help you. We wish you a very good night and thank you for joining us.